If you were near I-37 and Pecan Valley Drive, you may have seen the smoke, maybe even the flames. We're continuing to follow breaking news at this hour. San Antonio firefighters battling a fire at a building on the southeast side. Our Patty Santos is there live. I know, Patty, that you just visited with fire investigators. What are they saying about all this? Yeah, this is happening at the Villas at Pecan Manor. Uh, the good news is here that they have everything under control. Take a look behind me. This is the building where that fire was happening. Good news is this building was vacant. Uh, they tell us uh, they believe this started on the uh, second floor of this apartment complex. By the time firefighters got here, they say uh, the flames were already going through the roof and firefighters really had to be uh, pushing themselves to work quickly so that those uh, the wind didn't push the fire to nearby uh, buildings that were in fact occupied. Now they tell us because this uh building was under renovation. There was no drywall or anything inside of it. So everything really burned pretty quickly. One of the uh, uh, concerns that they initially had was that the uh, walls were collapsing. They were uh, being broken down by the fire. And so that was one of the concerns, but luckily no one was injured. Now there were some issues because of the water pressure, they tell us that was pushing through uh, the building. Some of the uh, water actually fell onto the windows in nearby uh, apartment uh, buildings and they uh, broke but that's something that they can replace really quickly. And they tell us nobody uh, should be impacted by that. But again, this fire, no one impacted because the building was not occupied. We'll send it back to you. I take a little issue with somebody saying that, uh, that, that we're not supportive of law enforcement because we are. A family said just that, and the district attorney today responded after a 15-year plea deal was offered to a man yesterday accused in the murder of SAISD detective of an SAISD detective. DA Joe Gonzalez and the lead prosecutor on the case sat down with our Erica Hernandez as they explained why this case was so difficult to take to trial. I typically do not grant uh, uh, live interviews before sentencing. We obviously don't want to affect uh, the actual sentencing, but it was important uh, uh, to talk today because I heard some things on your report yesterday that were disturbing to me. District Attorney Joe Gonzalez and Prosecutor Jeff Moliner spoke about what happened in the case that resulted in the death of SAISD Detective Cliff Martinez outside a Southside IHOP in 2019. Gonzalez says the defendant, Alfredo Martinez Contreras, should have never been indicted for capital murder in the first place, as there was no evidence showing Martinez Contreras in the vehicle that ran over Detective Martinez. As a matter of fact, the, the evidence that we have is uh, it was in dispute whether or not he was even at the scene. We believe that this defendant had already left the scene. Gonzalez and Moliner say that despite what Detective Martinez family told us yesterday, they were in communication with the Martinez family as the case moved along. Moliner even saying that the remark from the victim's brother about a plea deal being the only option and not caring what the family wants was not correct. I never said anything like that. I hope that he will pause and reflect and refresh his recollection uh, that, that what they think always mattered, always mattered a great deal. Another thing Gonzalez wanted to emphasize was his support for law enforcement after Detective Martinez's brother said he felt justice was not served. Well, I take a little issue with somebody saying that, uh, that, that we're not supportive of law enforcement because we are. And that's another uh, point I wanted to make clear to the family and to the public. Could you honestly say though, that justice was served for Cliff? In, in my mind, it, no. I, I mean, I, I think that, is, is it the result that we want it? Uh, no. We have to make decisions uh, that we believe are in the best interest of the memory of, of a, a victim like Cliff and in the interest of justice, and, and that's what I believe we did in this case. The Martinez family will be present on Monday for sentencing where Gonzalez says he will meet with the family again. Erica Hernandez, case at 12 News. A fight between two women outside of a bar near downtown ends with a man getting hit by a truck. It happened just before 2.30 this morning in the 1400 block of North Main Street. That's not far from McCullough and I-35. According to police, two women were fighting in the parking lot when one got into a truck and ran over a man that the other woman was with. That man hit was taken to Bamsey. He's expected to be okay. The woman driving the truck has not been found. San Antonio police say she will be charged with failure to stop and render aid as well as other charges when they find her.
In an emotional interview, the mother who survived a shooting opened up about the gradual progression of domestic violence in her life. From her hospital bed, Mariah Claire talked about the attack that killed her 11 month old daughter and left her two year old in intensive care. Two other children escaped the house. The accused attacker, this man, her ex husband, Stephen Claire. As she and her daughter head towards healing, Mariah wants abuse victims to understand domestic violence starts far before attacks like this happen. He's always been very controlling and very manipulative. The pressure, the intimidation, the fear that go with your gut instinct, trust it. If you don't feel safe, it isn't. That's Roseanne Paisano with the Bear County Family Justice Center. She says abuse doesn't have to be physical to be domestic violence. She says gaslighting, emotional and verbal abuse can slowly progress to dangerous physical situations. If you are experiencing domestic violence, help is out there. We have a list of resources at ksat.com slash domestic violence. A crime may actually be slightly down in San Antonio overall, but a massive spike in car thefts behind a 3.4% bump in property crime. During a presentation today on the city's first quarter crime stat, San Antonio police revealed that car thefts are up more than 59% in our city compared to the same time last year. Garrett Berger talks with the chief about what could be driving it. Assaults and other thefts may be lagging behind 2022 numbers in San Antonio, but car thefts have hit the gas in the first three months of 2023. It's jumping everywhere, not just here in San Antonio. Through March this year, there have been 1,600 more reports of stolen cars in the city than there were in the same period last year. I don't have any evidence-based reason why that's happening. One thing police can point to is the vulnerability of certain Kia and Hyundai models, which have been the focus of a social media trend. A variety of, of reasons why they're stealing them, but they, they I mean, it's, it's out there that they're easy to steal. The department's top 10 list of the most stolen vehicles last month is filled with Hyundais and Kias. In general, the police chief says cars are often stolen to commit other crimes or to be resold across the border. Though he said the department doesn't have data showing that particular point. The conversations with um, other law enforcement agencies is that they're heading to Mexico with them. Whatever the reasons, McManus thinks SAPD's vehicle theft unit needs beefing up. Also, okay. you know, 18 folks for a million and a half population, yeah. it's just not enough. For 42, 4,300 in one quarter, yeah, I can see how that's yes. not... Maybe not enough. And while the chief says the department will overhaul its strategy for investigating property crimes in June, he would not provide any details. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. With what happened in Uvalde in mind today at the state capitol, a House committee debating the firearms bills filed in response to that mass shooting at Robb Elementary. One of those bills would raise the minimum age to buy certain semi-automatic weapons, something Uvalde families have been advocating for since last year. It shouldn't have to be this way. If these laws would have been enacted when Santa Fe happened, then we wouldn't be here. Instead, they chose to do nothing, and now my son is dead as because of that. Some of the other bills aim to change how people buy guns, how certain sales are reported to authorities when background checks are required. The scammers continue to target vacant lots here around town, trying to sell them even though they don't own them. We know of at least two vacant properties in the Holotus area where scammers tried to cash in. It's happening nationwide. Con artists look for vacant land, impersonate the owner, contact a realtor to list the property, all in hopes of a quick cash transaction that's all done electronically. The Bear County Clerk says they are seeing more fraud attempts. She wants property owners to know they can sign up for what are called Vanguard property alerts. So anytime anybody files any kind of lien, any kind of loan, anything to affect your property, you'll get an alert by email. Signing up is free. You can do that through the Bear County Clerk's website. Just a couple of days as we count down to Fiesta 2023, people are making sure they have everything they need to be decked out for that party with a purpose. We found a crowd of shoppers today at Amos downtown. Look at this. Everyone there looking for those items to get them, their homes, their businesses in the Fiesta mood. 
That's and literally the reason I came. So I live off of like 1604 in Shanefield, and the reason we came here was because they're so much more cheaper. So uh, we didn't want to spend like 20 bucks on one at the actual festival. So we decided to come here. Yeah. I bought two, not enough of these for the house. I'm doing the whole fence around. And the top. We're finding it very interesting. We're finding things that we didn't even expect to find. It's great to see Amel's busy. I remember during the pandemic when it was empty there. Right now on KSAT.com, we have everything you need to know to plan your fiesta, event schedules, parking information, how you can watch all the parades. Just scan this QR code. That will take you to our KSAT Fiesta homepage. And of course, everybody wondering what the weather is going to be. Look at those dark clouds off in the distance, Adam. Yeah, a few of those dark clouds dropping some rain and even a little bit of lightning and thunder west of San Antonio at the moment and a few showers elsewhere. Here's a look at our live radar and just very light spritzes and sprinkles here. Wilson County stretching into northern Atascosa County. These are very short lived splash and dash. You see this animation over the past hour. It doesn't show these lasting very long, but there's been some more significant development in Medina County. This is just north of Highway 90, even stretching into Uvalde County, some heavier rain. And this is slowly pushing northward at 14, uh, about 15 miles per hour. So we can time this out, see when this, if it holds together, could even make it to Bandera. These are uh, just drifting northward a little bit, but should that hold together, that bigger batch, not this first line, that bigger line would make it to Bandera at 6.53 p.m. We'll take another look at the radar across our area and talk about our storm chances going forward, along with the strong cold front that's gonna affect your weekend in just a bit. Thanks, Adam. Let's take a live look right now with traffic at US 90 at Meteo Creek, and you can see no sign of the storms out there, although there is a bit of a slowdown. Heavy traffic, though, in both directions. And coming up after the break, Spurs executives and commissioners court asking for more games in Austin. That's not all the organization wants. Find out what else the Spurs are wanting. Up next. I'm Stephanie Jimenez. Here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. Pain at the pump, it's something that we could be feeling soon. Tonight, why experts with Gas Buddy expect fuel prices are going to go up and when we might start to see them come back down. Also, Uvalde, Sutherland Springs, and El Paso, just a few places that saw senseless mass shootings. They're also all in the San Antonio division of the FBI. And tonight, we're going to hear from the man in charge why he says that community involvement is crucial to preventing these shootings. We'll see you for these stories and a lot more tonight on The Night Beat. See you then. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, the Spurs are in a different type of court today, looking to extend a pilot program that allowed them to play home games away from the AT&T Center. The Spurs played a pair of games in Austin to close out the regular season. That option on the table again today for county commissioners to decide. RJ Marquez tells us more about the Silver and Black's plans to play future games outside of the Alamo City. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Any abstention? Motion unanimously carries. Thank you. Thank you. You're, thank you very much. County commissioners All voted right. unanimously today to allow the Spurs to play more regular season home games outside the AT&T Center for the next two seasons. We're going to have three games in it, so two in Austin, one international game for us at Mexico City. Spurs Sports and Entertainment believe this agreement is a win for San Antonio and a way to build their brand from Austin to Mexico. We think it's incredibly important for us to capture the competitive advantages that are available to us throughout our region. Spurs General Counsel Bobby Perez says internal surveys show that 90% of fans in the region, including Austin, want to watch games in San Antonio, and 77% want to spend a night here, meaning more overall business for the area. Bring people to hopefully Spurs games, if not a Spurs game, maybe an SAFC match, if not an SAFC match, a concert at the AT&T Center and again, pushing the San Antonio brand. The Spurs doubled down on their commitment to San Antonio, pointing to their half billion dollar performance campus, which is slated to begin opening this August. We're here today developing and continuing to, to emphasize that trust that we've built with this community for 50 years. This is just the first step in the Spurs playing more games away from the AT&T Center. All of these games, including the international game, are all subject to the NBA's approval and scheduling, but it appears likely as if the Spurs will get at least two more home games in Austin over the next two seasons. Reporting from the Bear County Courthouse, RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News.
All right, let's check out the weather situation outside. I was going to say a lot of people looking forward to Thursday and the start of Fiesta, but we've got some storms happening right now, Adam. Yeah, we do. Nothing severe, nothing dangerous right now. Just a few downpours with a little bit of lightning and thunder and then some spritzes and sprinkles around town. But there will be some big changes temperature wise to talk about in the days ahead. I'm going to start with that. We'll be 81 tomorrow, 84 on Thursday, Friday, 87. Then the cold front hits. It's going to affect your weekend. We're looking at highs in the low to mid 70s by Saturday and Sunday. So that's one major change that's coming our way right now. We have some areas of rain. Take a look at the radar and for the most part, not a whole lot across South Central Texas, but you look just west of San Antonio and that's where most of the action is right now in terms of the more considerable rain, the downpours that we have. Northern Medina County stretching into Uvalde County. This is where that activity is. And you, you notice we did have a few other showers over the past hour in parts of Kamal County, but they had a hard time holding together. Between Concan and Sabinal, one downpour. We're seeing a little bit of development here westward into Uvalde County. And so with this sunshine that we had a little bit of instability. We're getting some of these pop up showers and even thunderstorms. But other than a few exceptions, they're not going to drop a whole lot of rain. Uh, maybe a quick quarter of an inch out of these. This is moving right into Tarpley as we speak. And with these, it's hard to tell you exactly when it's going to be and where just because they're fairly short lived for the most part. So they don't always make it that far downstream. But that's what we're looking at out there right now. And once we lose our sunlight and our daytime heating, then I think we'll be losing these showers and the rain that uh, is actually more noticeable than what we have around San Antonio, which is really not that much other than a few sprinkles hardly even detected by the radar in south of town into Atascosa County. Some pockets of light rain as well particularly closer to Jordanton and just north of Charlotte there. But we will have other moisture sources overnight, and that's because of some drizzle that's going to be developing again in a few sprinkles. Big picture across the state, a few showers here and there. We've got some energy that's been moving through, so we've had some pockets of rain, especially in East Texas. That, of course, is where you don't need the rain. We need it right here more than anywhere across the state. We've got the biggest concentration of drought conditions and the worst categories of droughts. We need it more than anybody. There are more opportunities in this weather pattern that we're in, and the big picture does show this upper level disturbance that's moving to the Pacific Northwest, Washington and Portland. Now that's going to pass to the north of us. However, this trough with it, that troughy pattern is going to help influence our temperatures as we go into the weekend and then also help to kickstart maybe a few storms on Friday as the cold front moves through and bottom line, it's the opposite of having the big blue H overhead. So rain chances actually exist every day except for Saturday. So Saturday plans beautiful day to be outdoors and the rain chances only 20 to 30 percent Thursday at 30 percent Thursday Friday we could have a few isolated severe storms pop up that's something we'll be watching otherwise no big scale system to give us that good soaking rain just yet temperatures out there right now we're at 78 dew point of 64 wind out of the southeast at 20 81 in Hondo, 77 in Holotus, 77 in Converse. And by tomorrow morning, we'll be at 68 degrees. A little bit of dampness, some fog, some drizzle, a few sprinkles, then a 20% chance of a few of these pop-up showers again tomorrow afternoon and even a few rumbles of thunder. 81 the high temperature. That's locally, 79 in Holotus, 81 Comfort, New Braunfels 82 and Pleasanton 83. We warm up to 87 as we talked about on Friday to see those temperatures fall off. Saturday, sunny. No humidity, 51 in the morning, a high of 70, and Sunday, even a few degrees cooler with a high of 70. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, so Larry got the opportunity today to talk to Troy Aikman, yeah. talk Jerry Jones, beer brands. Jerry Jones, beer <laughs> brands. I love it. Yeah, yeah, so here's the thing. A lot of Cowboys fans don't feel that they'll win another Super Bowl as long as Jerry Jones is owner, general manager. So we asked Troy Aikman about that today. And will the Houston Texans trade away their second pick? Are they considering it, at least? Coming up. Time Super Bowl champion Troy Aikman is celebrating the first anniversary of his beer, 8 Elite Light Lager. He brewed the beer and launched it 
in the Lone Star State last spring. Now more on that in a minute, of course. Troy led the Cowboys to their last Super Bowl championship in January 1996 when they beat the Steelers 27-17 to win Super Bowl 30. And since then, nothing. I mean, that was their last Super Bowl appearance. There are some that say the boys will not win the big game again as long as Jerry Jones is the owner and general manager. Now we asked Troy, how does he feel about that? Well, they haven't yet. So, I mean, and, and, you know, until that happens, people that say that are right. You know, it's kind of like Dak. Is, can he win a Super Bowl? Well, you know, until he does, there's always going to be those questions as to whether or not he will. Um, I don't know. I, I think the, the, the confusing part has been they have been really good in the preseason. I mean, pre, in the regular season. They've done a lot of good things. They've won a lot of games. And for whatever reason, it just hasn't translated into a great deal of success in the postseason. They haven't played their best football uh, when they've gotten into the postseason. How do you change that? I think that's the that's the million dollar question. We spoke with Troy at Perry's Pizzeria and Tap House. He was there to talk about his beer, Eight Elite Light Lager. Since its launch last spring, Eight Elite achieved the number one spot of best selling new independent beer per IRI, a company that tracks that type of data. Now, we asked Troy if he dreamed it would become so popular. Yeah, probably. I'm a pretty optimistic guy, and we had high expectations, but uh, it, it, it's done really well. I think that. Uh, I, there's a couple things. One, I'm really proud of my team. Uh, I have great partners. I have really smart partners. I learned a long time ago that you're only as good as the teammates you have. And I've had great teammates throughout my life, and I do with the Beer Project. Uh, but even those that are out in the field uh, do an unbelievable job. So I'm proud for a startup company to be able to have the impact that we've had. But then also just uh, the way that it's been received and the taste. And I think that people... Uh, uh, that have tried it, you know, he's come back and it's resonated well with them. With the 2023 NFL Draft next week, the Houston Texans are working overtime to figure out what they should do with the second overall pick. The common thought is they'll draft a quarterback, either Bryce Young or C.J. Stroud. There's also a chance they could pick who they think is the best player available, which may not be a QB. During his pre-draft presser yesterday, Texans GM Nick Casario was asked about the possibility of trading away the second pick to team up to look up to another team who's just moving up in the draft. We've received some calls actually on the number two pick so i think our job and responsibility is to listen um you know not rule anything out um and i think whatever the end result is um come thursday you know we'll be prepared to go um either way so if you want to quote me are we open for business i'd say we're open to listening so if you want to change the vocabulary this year a little bit but uh, we have received a few calls, um, and again, I think our responsibility is to listen, um, to try to take the information in, and then just make the right decision. The NFL Draft starts Thursday to 27th with the first round, and the remaining six rounds will take place on Friday and Saturday, all in Kansas City. UTSA baseball team made the D1 baseball rankings for the first time ever, coming in at number 25. They also earned a spot on three other polls. UTSA will host Texas State tonight. We'll have those highlights for you on the night beat. Always a big rivalry when UTSA and Texas stay play in anything in anything indeed all right thank you larry coming up after the break we're going to talk prop a with a woman who was vital in getting it on the ballot we're going to talk about it coming up the mayor is on the ballot the city council is on the ballot but it seems as if prop a is getting the most attention before the may 6th election so joining us we have ananda thomas with Act for SA, you were vital in getting Prop A on the ballot. Thank you for joining us. Last Thursday, we had Danny Diaz with the San Antonio Police Officers Association join us. He's against Prop A. Yes. You were obviously for Prop A. And so what I want to know right now, before we get into any of the allegations back and forth, how do you feel the campaign is going right now in favor of Prop A? Absolutely. So first off, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, the campaign's actually going very well. We do think it is going to be a close race, but it's those conversations with folks at the doors, on the phones, the person-to-person -person interaction. When we walk them through what is on the ballot and why it's important to their community, it resonates. We all know somebody who uh, has smoked marijuana, right? We all have been affected by mass incarceration, whether it's through our friends or families. We all... Uh, know somebody or love somebody that thought about getting an abortion or did or needed to get reproductive health care. And so we all have a tie into this. Is that the main
main selling point that you tell people when you're like, if they're on the fence or if they're against, why should I vote for Prop A? What is your, what is your standing at the door pitch? Yeah, so um, I mean, the first part obviously is walking them through what this is, but also what it means for the community. So Prop A is actually the first abortion related ballot initiative, not just in Texas, but the entire South since the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So to make our voices heard on reproductive justice, on abortion rights, on criminal justice, on police reform, all of these things that we have been having conversations in our community with over the past few years, this is the people legislating themselves and taking it to a vote to say to your elected officials, uh, both at the state and local level, this is how we feel and the type of solutions that we want to find because it saves our community. What do you say to people who say, yes, you can make a stance on abortion, you can take a stance on marijuana, but it doesn't change the law. Like it can't be done at a local level. It has to be a state or federal level for some of those things. So this would decriminalize low level marijuana and abortion, which is close to deprioritization. We are, as a home rule city get to direct our tax dollars, including our police officers and say, we actually want you to focus on violent and more pressing crimes and not be policing women or pregnant people for, uh, for the healthcare decisions that they make or doctors, because that is not the priority for our community and not what we view as keeping and making our community safe. There, I've also heard the criticism that there's just too much in here. It should have been separated into different charter amendments. How do you, how do you answer that? Yeah, I mean, the first part of that is that um, both the city and even the Supreme Court at one point had the choice to decide whether to split this up or not. But secondly, we're having these conversations about intersectionality, to speak about criminal justice reform, to speak about racial justice, to speak about police reform, and now reproductive justice because we're threatening doctors and pregnant people with life in jail for getting an abortion. These are all tied together now. We can't speak about one without the other. It's all under the compass of public safety. Well, I, want to talk, I want to play a soundbite now from Danny Diaz. I said we had him on last Thursday. Right. Uh, and he made some allegations that I think wouldn't be fair with, without letting you respond. So Appreciate I want to play that. a soundbite right now from Danny Diaz from last Thursday. Act for SA states that there are nonviolent crimes you know, that's that's not true because there's a uh, simple assault that's in there. Uh, we can tie that into family violence and there's voyeurism. You know, who doesn't want a peeping Tom arrested? Now to Thomas, I'm going to give you the chance to respond to what Danny had to say there. Absolutely. So uh, this does include most Class C misdemeanors. Class C uh, misdemeanor for family violence or assault means that no physical injury happened. It's words only. However, under Article 14 with your Texas uh, Code of Criminal Procedures, if there is a threat of self-harm, physical self-harm to yourself or to anybody in the house as defined as assault and family violence, that officer always has discretion to arrest you, regardless of if it's just a Class C or something higher. So, it, 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 Police officers will say you're taking some of that discretion away, though, when it comes to graffiti, when it comes to shoplifting, when it comes to some of the other things that are that are on the ballot. Yeah, so this is guided discretion. Um, just because a citation eligible offense happens does not mean an officer cannot arrest. If this is not a Bear County resident, if this person requests to go before the magistrate, if another offense happened that's not citation eligible, they have a warrant out for their arrest, they don't have a proper ID, there's a threat of harm to somebody else or themselves, they can still arrest that person should they choose to. But really a citation is a citation to appear to court uh, if you don't appear to court, then you have a warrant out for your arrest. And that judge, uh, when you appear at the reentry center with that citation, can decide, hey, this is actually only punishable by fine, which all Class C misdemeanors are only punishable by fine anyway, or this is something that deserves jail time, or you're going to a diversion program, which requires community service, classes, fines and fees, and in some cases, restitution to be paid back to the business or whoever you offended against. Yeah, because that, that's, a, that's an interesting point to bring up because I've heard the argument that without the threat of jail time for some of these things, people are going to not be deterred from doing some of these things. That, that jail time is a deterrent, so we shouldn't do site and release for some of these things like graffiti and shoplifting. Yeah, so the data doesn't actually show that. According to the district attorney who oversees our diversion programs, folks that go through and complete the diversion program have an 8% reoffender rate. 
We have a 22% reoffender rate for the uh, state of Texas, so we're literally cutting that in half. Um, further, if you do not finish your diversion program, uh, you get in trouble during it, you're going straight back to that judge to you know, face the music. So there's lots of accountability and things that have been thought about in here of how we can address public safety in a way that's not over criminalizing communities, but more than that, relieving the burden on our criminal justice system, our overburdened officers, our court dockets, and our judges. You're, you're facing a coalition that I don't know that I've ever seen before in San Antonio, where you have the Police Officers Association, yes. you have a lot of the big businesses in town, and you have five city council members and the mayor recently who have come out in opposition to Proposition A. How are you viewing that opposition from all these different kind of, you know, usually not seeing eye to eye coalitions? Yeah, you know, um it is disappointing to see so many of our elected officials giving into fear mongering and misinformation um, and siding against this. But we do have three local city council members who have endorsed this. We're endorsed by a coalition of grassroots organizations, including Planned Parenthood Texas Votes, Bear County Democratic Party, the Green Party of Texas, uh, Move Texas, right? We have our own coalition of organizations that are fighting for this because we know how important this is to our community. I appreciate it. May 6th, early yes. voting starts in a couple of weeks here. April 24th. Yeah, so your gut feeling as you head towards Election Day. You know, I really think that the that our community is going to see, right, the importance of this. Do you want to continue with solutions or do you want to give in to fear mongering or misinformation that's out there? These are programs that have been proven to be successful. Cite and release as a state law has been around since 2007. It's going to continue whether Prop A passes or not, but what we can do is codify it to make sure that more of those citations are going out. Do you want to make your voice heard on abortion so you know that your city leadership can say, I know this is how my district feels on abortion rights, on reproductive justice, on police accountability, and I have to continue finding these solutions either way because that's what your vote in this narrative is saying besides winning the actual policy to decriminalize our communities. Anada Thomas, appreciate your time. Yes, thank you. You bet. We'll be right back.